what I learned is that my voice would actually help to change things as an artist. If I specified that I wanted a diverse crew at every production, my team would make it happen because they want to keep me as a client. Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be getting to know singer and songwriter Noel Skaggs. As the co-lead vocalist of the alt-pop band Fits in the Tantrum since 2008, Noel was used to seeing huge crowds through her years of life performance and touring. Fits in the Tantrum songs Out of My League and The Walker, both of which Noel co-wrote, were certified platinum and hit the number one spot on the alternative airplay chart, and in 2016 their song Hand Clap became a bona fide sensation. It was a triple platinum international hit that anyone could hear anywhere, basically, from Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade to Fox's Super Bowl pre-show is hard to miss. However, what Noel wasn't used to seeing while on tour were Black women like her in any of the myriad behind-the-scenes positions that make tours possible. So when the pandemic hit and tours were canceled, Noelle gathered her thoughts and then decided to speak up. She wrote an open letter to the music industry that Billboard published in September 2020. In the letter, she states, quote, As an artist and a Black woman of color, I can and will no longer accept being the only person like me in any room or any stage, unquote. And then she goes on to announce the creation of Diversify the Stage. Diversify the Stage is a two-pronged initiative to ensure that ethnic and sexual minorities, as well as people with disabilities, are not only trained for technical and production positions in the touring industry, but also have access to job opportunities in those fields. Noelle spoke to me from her home in Los Angeles. I started by asking her how she developed the idea for Diversify the Stage. I think the initial idea really started, you know, of course, last year was a pretty heavy year for just the Black community in general. All people, you know, with COVID going on, but specifically the Black community, just with all of the violence that, you know, we were having to absorb things that we had known about for years that have been happening and going on for decades now, but it being put in front of everyone and everyone needing to now participate in, um, you know, fighting against it. For me, it was a lot of conversations that were really going on within the music industry as it related to like social impact and equity for black and brown communities, just BIPOC communities in general. And I felt like there were some major conversations that weren't going on about a massive part of our industry, you know, when we're looking at our touring business and our live community and, you know, all of the things that I've noticed throughout my career. So I just really wanted to, you know, kind of start a dialogue, really. I, you know, was really doing posts on my social media accounts and having discussions with people on the side, my touring teams, and just really trying to identify how people put together a touring event, you know, like how, like who does what and what is the process and how is my tour manager finding these vendors and who's supplying the staff? And, you know, like I was just really getting micro and to wanting to learn more about this side of the industry that I, you know, honestly, I'd slept through, you know, it's like we spend our time on our buses and we're getting on stage to do our job and we show up and everything is done and hopefully nothing goes and falls apart while we're in the process of performing for fans and, and doing what we do creatively. So I, I was very disconnected from that side of the business because I really didn't need to get involved in it. But what I learned is that my voice would actually help to change things as an artist. If I specified that I wanted a diverse crew at every production, my team would make it happen because they want to keep me as a client. Oh. So I learned my power in the use of my voice and expressing the things that I wanted to see internally, you know, throughout my business. So I figured, why not create these types of actions and this type of education 
for all artists that are really interested in bringing significant change to our business in areas that we are uneducated about, you know? So that was really how I kind of started the process. And within that, the more information that I was exposed to, I learned that I needed to go a step further. And that's how Diversify the Stage was born. Diversify the Stage has developed into basically a network of industry professionals who have the same goals and are in, in alignment with my vision for creating more diverse and inclusive and equitable spaces for all people in this industry. And also a network of community engagement organizations that have been doing this work for a long time under the radar and just really working together and pulling our resources to really activate a common change and create more standard practices of intention as it relates to hiring, you know, as it relates to creating safe spaces for our fans, for, for our staff members. We're looking at everything from HR practices, you know, being implemented into touring teams, uh, simple trainings for inclusion. We're looking at mental health on top of the intention of diversity when you're, when you're hiring and education, really looking to uplift the next generation that may have no idea that these career paths exist by engaging them in educational, you know, opportunities for master classes, having folks like you know, Jerome Crooks, who was the tour manager of Nine Inch Nails and Soundgarden and Tina Ferris, who's been, you know, running her own tour direction and production company for years and, and really putting an intention on hiring Black communities for these shows uh, that she's been producing and stuff and having them speak to young people about what they do and what their path was and things that, you know, they should consider learning through this process of them kind of trying to find their way in the music industry. Because so much of that work is word of mouth, right? So yes. if you're in any way out of the loop, you have no idea these jobs exist. Exactly, exactly. So I wanted to kind of take that practice that we're already used to, this word of mouth formula, and put it into a space that can actually help educate others that wouldn't know. You know, I have young drummers that have been playing, you know, and, and want to be on stage and have no idea that drum techs exist. And people are making a living off of supporting a drummer and being, you know, being a part of the process of even the recording. Because if you're really even good at that, right, if you understand the balance of sound, you know, on a live setting and within the, you know, the recorded process, and you understand how to really maximize and, and make a, another drummer shine, that's a career path you can have for the rest of your life with one band. Are you enjoying this work? I, it, it's very fulfilling. I think for me, it's been kind of a life-changing moment and that I've been engaged with not only the process of doing something that I think will have a long-term effect on our industry in a positive direction, I've also been able to impact young people. Because in this process of me working towards building the big picture alongside a lot of other folks, I've also been engaged in putting a process of education together for young people and exposing them to this industry and getting them workforce placement and being a part of their journey from last year, October, up until even now, because I'm still having a lot of conversations with the alumni cohort that I was able to take on. I you know, was able to develop a college age apprenticeship program that I'm going to continue doing and really focusing in on this boutique method of bringing up young people into this industry and doing it in a way where the music industry as a whole can be invited to participate, either in all three phases, the three phases being the master classes, which is planting the seed in, in the, the minds of young people, the mentorship which activates not only as you being a support person for this young person that is going through their journey, but also their referral. And then the next step, moving them into apprenticeship and workforce, you know, kind of placement with our network partners. So really creating this kind of village workshop <laughs> for people to be able to participate in. 
it's been really amazing to kind of see one, you know, not, not only the impact that, you know, it's been having on myself and the students, but also the people that have been involved. Can you give us some examples? Yeah. Yeah. I had a, you know, really great conversation with a gentleman by the name of Chris Gratton, who, uh, you know, works with Justin Bieber. He was talking to me about one of the students that he mentored from my program and how he still talks to her. You know, the, the program is about six months long and he is just blown away by her, her passion for what she does, how smart she is. They're talking about doing other projects and stuff together. And it's just really cool to see how his mentoring of this young woman has made an effect on him and how he wants to continue that work with other people. It's really incredible to see that this person that's been in the game for as long as he has been, who who is working with the caliber of artists that he's working with, be so passionate about this one student, you know, that he had the ability to engage with and, you know, how he's impact, you know, she's impacted him just in the way that she thinks and, you know, watching her grow in her journey. Imagine, uh, like, close your eyes and imagine five, 10 years from now, hopefully five, that a lot of the goals of Diversify the Stage have been accomplished. Mm-hmm. And that, in fact, the touring world is much more diverse than what you're experiencing now. How would you feel that difference as you're out on the road for all those months? How would it be qualitatively different for you? Um, I think it would be, you know, for me, looking around and, and knowing that there are people that can identify with my journey or at least have some kind of commonality with it's kind of hard to explain. Like everybody's struggle is different. My, my struggle is a lot different from somebody that identifies as Latino or Asian. You know, it's just really being able to look around the room and notice the rainbow tribe. And the energy is just different. If you sat down and you talked to anybody that started hiring women in their crew and how different the energy is as opposed to what it was when it was all men, They tell you hands down, they'll never do another tour where it doesn't have a gender balance ever again. It softens the testosterone in the room. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, and and it's, it's noticeable and women notice it too. You know, they notice it and it's even better when there's, you know, racial diversity or, you know, religious diversity, it just makes for a better environment. You know, people are able to learn from each other and, it's hard to do that when you are walking the same road. Yeah, that's all I can say there. You know, it's like our team, you know, we've always been really good about hiring as it relates to gender balance, you know, because I spent a year on the road with basically me being the only woman and it really started to get to me. So we made it a conscious decision to make sure that we were hiring women or whoever, you know, non-binary, whatever. So you you your voice at a certain point and express yeah. your your discomfort. How was that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was great. I think also it was noticeable. I think our tour manager at the time noticed. He was like, "Yeah, we need to get more women because I, you know, I don't want Noel to be alone." You know, so for him at the time it was really our tour manager speaking up on it and then me saying something independently of that conversation and the management being supportive of it. What in this work came naturally to you, to your artist spirit and your experience as an artist, and what skills did you have to develop? I think my negotiating, my ability to think on a very micro level has helped me tremendously. Is that a skill you use in your songwriting, the micro? Yeah, I think so. Uh Yeah, the micro, I think, really comes down to me being a lyricist and, and how I look at lyrics and you know, how I really think about storytelling and how things for me have to make sense in order for me to feel that it's done. I also have to be able to see it visually. Like I know a song is done when I can literally create the entire music video in my head at the end of it, you know, or I have some type of visual picture of what it could look like, or I just get some type of like dreamy kind of thing that will tie into a visual element of the record. That's how I know it's done. And usually when I can't see that, there's something missing. You know, there's something that's not really fully connecting to my spirit. 
And in this work, it's, you know, allowed me to not only like go on a micro level and talk to different people and create this vision, like it's really helped me brainstorm. You know, it's so funny because I talked to my friend, Ali Harnell, who's the VP of uh, strategy at Live Nation Women, who's also been a, a major part of this. And she's like, I cannot believe the way that you think about this. Like, how do you even have time? And I think I've always been this way where I can literally dive into something so deeply and come out at the end of it with some form of an idea that people can help me bring to life. And what has not come quite as easily for you? Um, I don't know anything about building a business. (laughs) (laughs) As it relates to, you know, really thinking about nonprofits and the infrastructure and all of the things that need to go into it, hiring, having the right people in place and the, you know, the containers and all this stuff. So that, that stuff has been a real learning curve for me. And I've had to kind of really bring myself out of the space and say, hey, I don't know enough about this to be able to take this on and asking for help, you know, knowing how to ask for help in it. But there has been other things where I'm like, if I don't learn how to do this on my own, we're not going to get across the finish line because I can't even possibly formulate the question to ask you. I almost have to go through the trial and error in order for me to understand the right question to ask. And that's been a a bit of the process for me. That sounds like a very artistic thing to do, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like, let me, let me write as many garbage songs as <laughs> Let me throw something then... at the wall and, <laughs> and see what sticks. <laughs> right. what sticks. Yeah. And that's really been, you know, fortunately, you know, I've had, I've, I've been smart enough to have people in place that know way more than me. So, you know, the ship hasn't fallen apart, but you know, I probably could have done things a little bit differently as far as having the infrastructure in place before I pulled the trigger on the college age program. But I also kind of felt like we got enough time to really get this right. And for me to have enough time to formulate the plan come 2022 and know that it's going to be executed well, because we've already done this pilot. And the fact that I've been able to place 80% of my students and jobs, and not just like, there are some that have taken wow, multiple. That, wait, say that again, because it's yeah, an amazing... COVID, 80% of my cohort have been placed in paid opportunities through the process of me Congratulations, having... that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I, I you know, I... I always feel really weird about like saying it, but if I don't put it out there, you know, I I think I I get really hard on myself. You know, it's like, oh, this one student, I haven't been able to do this with yet. And, you know, I forget about all of the other people that I have been able to help. And, you know, I, I need to give myself credit. So it's kind of, you know, my thing, it's not really like a bragging right, but it's also to kind of affirm like, hey, Noelle, yes, you are on the right path. Keep moving, keep moving. Don't get distracted by the doubt. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, uh, knowing that I've been able to kind of do that in this time, right. And the most challenging time of the industry kind of really gives me hope and knowing that we'll be successful when things really start picking up again and we're able to place more students. Right. As I was, as I've been listening to your music and watching your videos, one thing I noticed was like, oh, there is there's a black woman and a white man on stage singing together, which made me realize that is not something I see very much in front yeah. men and front women. So I'm yeah. wondering if if you think the changes you're working toward will also have an effect on the diversity of artists within individual groups or ensembles. It's crazy because I'm already starting to see it. I mean, if you look at, you know, some of the alternative bands even coming out of the lecture right now, they're all mixed. You know, they they have like, you know, different ethnic backgrounds, different gender or non-gender, you know, identifying folks. And it's it's really cool to see the young generation kind of fall into this natural pocket of being with different people and having different experiences. So I imagine too, as these new younger bands start hiring for their own crews, they will automatically want crews that are as diverse as they are, right? Yeah. I mean, as long as they have an understanding of, again, that that power and and asking, you know, like I said, you know, when we're thinking about just the music industry in general, 
and the mysteries, right? We try to we try to keep the artists away from things that they shouldn't have to worry about. Be it building up their team, you once they find a manager or the agent or the blah 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 blah, all the things that we don't have to worry about. You know, just thinking about the collective of of really educating young people. I'm seeing it a lot in hip hop. If we're just thinking about what's happening with young hip hop artists right now and ownership of their commodity, uh-huh. if we can kind of start seeing that type of education fall into their live business and and how that's built and who's involved, I mean, sky's the limit for the next gen. You know what I mean? Like sky's the limit. I think like, you know, there may be bands in, at my age it's like if it ain't broke don't fix it you know kind of thing and those those are i think those are going to be the challenges that i have with some of you know some of the folks that i may approach about joining in and supporting diversify the stage in this coming initiative i think for the most part people are now i think 2020 is not going to get lost in people's mind there's no way i think you can turn off the effects of last year and just move on like it never happened especially in the music industry. The music industry is a universal language for everyone. I think it's just a matter of educating artists on what they can do and the little steps that they can take to help improve and evolve our industry on a collective thing. And then also just educating people in, in, in general about, you know, just acknowledging <laughs> that somebody may have a different path than they do and just really educating our older people on the new you know way of of being considerate of people you know whether or not we're thinking about accessibility or we're thinking about uh, mental health and making sure that our counselors have education and the black experience in some way and what it is to counsel somebody that has a path of, of being a BIPOC person in an environment where they're considered the minority. I want to end focusing on your art and ask you, as you look ahead over the next 12 months, what artistic project are you most excited to work on? Oh, definitely getting back in the, you know, the, the studio and working on our, our fifth record with the band. I also have my own you know, projects that I, I really want to you know, kind of finish up. I, I took a bit of a break from songwriting because I needed to find my footing in music again. I had like a, was having a bit of a battle in deciding what I really wanted to do even before, you know, diversify the stage became a thing. And uh, I think I figured it out. Like I found my voice and my purpose again and why I got into this business in the first place, you know, and it's really to help people. I don't think I ever did anything in this industry for myself. And I don't think that's ever going to change from writing a song that may change another person's life or making a business decision that impacts a young person and taking the same road. You know, like I've always kind of done things in the hopes that it would inspire other people to take the leap. And, uh, you know, so far so good. If you'd like to learn more about Noel and read a longer version of this interview, please head to uncsa.edu slash art restart. And be sure to follow or subscribe us. You don't want to miss the truly galvanizing guests we'll be hearing from in upcoming episodes. Special thanks to Katie Kane and Bradley Kriegel. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Pier Carlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Keenan Institute for the Arts, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>